thank you for letting me speak. It's a, a very precious moment for me to talk to you because, yeah, you will, you will see. I'm going to talk to you about the last 35 years of paleoanthropology in my life and in the life out there. Um, I was a biologist, uh, I am a biologist and paleoanthropologist, but I swapped my uh, profession before I analyzed bones. Now I'm analyzing souls. So um, <laughs> I'm now a psychotherapist because I had to uh, leave academia. I was there 15 years about. I had to leave because of a um, um, chronic disease. Um, so it's a very interesting topic. I got into the topic when I was uh, teaching in school. Um, evolution of man and I was wondering hmm on the one side everything was straight with the evolutionists and on the other side the creationist view were kind of strange and not really scientific so I dived right into a PhD and worked with fossils and this is something I want to talk to you about in the next 30 minutes 30 years and 30 minutes. I hope I don't run out of time. <laughs> so, and I need to get this one. Okay, if you talk about evolution uh, of man from ape to man or wherever it comes from, you have to look at three main features. It's locomotion, the bipedal gait, it's brain size and shape, it's specific skills in human like to use and to making and art. What you want to know for a potential transition is um, you know you have to know anything everything about locomotion the ape like forms they're more climbing and knuckle walking with strong long arms and short legs while the humans are bipedal forms with short arms and long legs so you will find this kind of um, colors throughout, throughout my talk, and you always know blue is human and red is ape. So small brain for the apes and large brain for humans. And if you look at the locomotion here, or in Otan and Shims, they do have four hands with power grip. Humans, of course, have two hands and two feet and the hands with a precision, precision grip. And sometimes four feet. <laughs> I'm talking, I'm starting with the golden age, the 80s, the golden age of paleoanthropology. And everything then was nice and easy. So there were just skulls, teeth, some jaws, and um, thank you. But they were also starting to, we get some fossils, postcranial skeletons, nice skeletons, and everybody of you know that there's Lucy. Finder was John Johansson. He found <coughs> Lucy and Lucy's child, and everything seemed quite easy. Here, yeah, that's me, <laughs> 35 years ago, and I was thinking about we are discrete types. There's an ape and a human standing here, and here's a gap. And on the other side, linear trees, that's what evolution is saying, from Lucy to Dawn. So there are several paleo paradigms in the 80s, like the view where everything had to fit in. It was bipedality first and brain last. Africa is the cradle of humankind, of everything. Laid out of Africa. Little migration and no hybridization. This is the frame. So Lucy, the great lady of missing links. Bipedal knee. Footprints in light knee. You will know it. And a very primitive scar. So isn't it wonderful? By fidelity first, we are almost there. Primitive scar. And he uh, dubbed, Don Johansson dubbed this um, 
wonderful skeleton as Australopithecus afarensis. Australopithecus, this genus was already known, and the new species name afarensis. It's the perfect ancestor. And it's even beaten the, the other candidate for ancestry, Australopithecus africanus. Okay, we're gradually walking towards humanity. We are almost there. Here we have Lucy, bipedal, ape-brained, seed eater. Here we have Mario Kotome uh, erectus, bipedally, brainy, and a toolmaker. So nice gap between ape-like forms and humans. So for everybody, it was nice and easy. The initial reconstruction on the left side was challenged by Peter Schmidt from Zurich. He said, well, this European challenge whereas Lucy's body construction is more similar to an ape than to a human. This was his reconstruction and a revised one. And you can see that the construction of the body seems less human-like as the left one. We look at this. Actually, I was joining this gang in Zurich uh, a couple of years later. Um, here we have read all the ape-like features and human-like features on the left, and two human-like features and many more ape-like features than before. So it's more a waddling biped with climbing abilities than it was before. So it's kind of like, hmm, is Lucy a climber, a walker towards humanity? A little less perfect <coughs> ancestor. This was all in the 80s. And there was the mantra of paleoanthropology, we need more fossils. This is too difficult to go on. And Lucky Don found a wonderful second partial skeleton called Homo habilis. He called it Homo habilis because of the human-like jaw. This was the diagnostic feature. And some long bones from arms and neck. He also had tools close by. So it was the dream tree. The dream tree of uh, Don Johansson, Afarensis, habilis, sapiens. However, what did he? wrote a book, it was called Lucy's Child, because he assumed Lucy is younger, Lu uh, Lu Lucy is older, this one is younger, and this is a nice tree forming uh, towards Homo sapiens. So I met Don Johansson in 98, and were allowed to do some measurements on this Lucy's Child, and, but this was kind of like shaking his dream team, dream tree. <laughs> this is hard. So I was uh, in this Zurich gang and mounting um, the, uh, the bones in, in such a, uh, a frame. And if you just look at it, you have the impression, well, the arms kind of like longer and the legs kind of like shorter than Lucy, but of course you have to measure it. We have heard that mathematics analysis is the most important. <laughs> so Peter Schmidt taught me anatomy and Bob Martin, my supervisor, was, is the Pope of Alamotry and he taught me how to take size into account. So uh, we did some uh, measurements, allometric comparisons of arm and leg dimensions of Lucy and Lucy's child and African apes and humans. So the red one are the African apes. I plotted arm and <coughs> leg dimensions. <coughs> the red one, African apes, arm dominant, strong arms and long arms, and humans, the leg dominant. And what you can see here, does this work? Well, um, Lucy is plotted close to the humans, kind of like in between. But look at OH62 here, Lucy's child. It's plotted right away to the African apes. So what does this mean? Is Hobo habilis even more ape-like than Lucy? 
this is the publication I wrote with Bob Martin. And these findings were confirmed by many others. So what is it? Is Homo habilis a brainy climber? This is kind of an upside down tree, isn't it? And a nice gap. I need this one. Um, still, um, Africanus is still uh, the rival of, no, Afarensis is still the rival of um, Africanus, but if you look at the uh, skeletons, you can see that different body parts make different trees. Afarensis skull looks more ape-like, Africanus skull more human-like, and so on. So it is kind of strange, different body parts make different trees. So we need more fossils. This is the mantle which comes mm -hmm. and comes. So um, there's another wonderful find in the um, several years ago, uh, 18 years ago, and it's called Selam because it makes peace. It's supposed to make peace with the egg-like reconstruction of Lucy. It's another afarensis. And the red stuff you see is all the ape-like traits, and the blue stuff only to human-like traits. So this makes Lucy even more ape-like than before. Well, there was another skeleton found, which is also called Afarensis. It's called the big brother of Lucy, and it really is big, 180 versus one meter of um, Lucy, and this big brother of Lucy has, oh look, human-like shoulder girdle, hip and shin bone, and it's completely bipedal. So big brother of Lucy makes Afarensis look even more human than anything before. So what? Is Lucy more ape-like, or is it more human-like? You get the question, maybe these are different species? Or is this a species with such extremely wide dis uh, variability? It is also Afarensis, big brother is Afarensis. Yeah, it was um, diagnosed Afarensis and several people said, this can't be. Well, I, I uh, don't give any conclusions on this. Because we're now going on to more skeletons and more surprises, here we've got the whole gang of um, uh, partial skeletons we know. Um, uh, 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, there were only four of them known. Three of them I already have shown to you. And there are new species now coming up, one species after another, one. Uh, skeletal after another. And one of the new species is Australopithecus sediba. Uh, it's less than two million years old, less than two million years, found by Lee Berger in 208. Two <coughs> nice postcranials, two nice skeletons, partial skeletons. One is the name, um, the answer, and one of the finer and describer, Jeremy Silver, said. If they weren't associate skeletons, I would have placed them into two to three species. Here's the same, about 50-50 homo-like features and ape-like features. What is kind of funny is that morphologically, the foot and the hand <coughs> is divided into two morphological directions. The foot is both bipedal and great like because it has a big toe and its ankle is quite human-like. And the hand is the same. It has a precision grip and a power grip. So a nice mix, isn't it? So what does the answer say? It has bipedal legs, climbing arms, by a standing foot, grasping toe, position grip bow, power climbing grip, a human face, a small brain, it's the perfect mix, not us, well, mix. And Lee Berger was very excited, and he said, Sidiba is the answer, the Rosetta Stone for human ancestry. 
So a human face, a brain, bipedal plimer. It is too young to be ancestral to human, to homo, because it's less than too many years old. And Don Johansson said, oh, doesn't it look like Boat 62 happiness? Well, here we have got all these fine, uh, all these species we found, <coughs> and no tree. Andy Berger said, the finder of Sediba, it's likely a candidate. This was a couple of months later. Adi Sediba is likely, a likely a is as likely a candidate for Homo ancestry as any other hominin fossil, perhaps the best. So, Sediba gives the following answer. It's many mixed up almost ancestors, almost ancestors, sometimes untimely, with body parts pointing towards different phylogenetic directions, creating many different conflicting trees. Facial mm -hmm. mm -hmm. twist, brain twist, brain shape twist, teeth twist, and so on. Many almost ancestors make no ancestor. And many trees also make no tree. So maybe give up on tree and give up on looking for ancestors. That's what Friedemann Schrenk from um, uh, Frankfurt was suggesting a couple of years ago. Another new skeletons from the species Homo. We had Australopithecus by then. And Bernard Wood was clearly stating 1999 what human is. The definition of the genus Homo is bipedal, brainy, to a <coughs> So here we have a wonderful new skeleton 10 years ago. No, 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 no. <laughs> Time is running. Um, this is called Homo naledi from the cradle of humankind in South Africa. It was. Um, excavated and an extremely difficult position from a cave system. We had to crawl at two different pieces. You have to crawl through very thin, very thin camels. One camel, Lee Berger got stuck and he had to get pulled up. <laughs> so here, right there in this chamber, they found 1,500 uh, fossils of more than 15 individuals. And there were no other mammal fossils in there, only hominid fossils. And what they suggest, this suggests, well, not flooding with water, but it was artificially deposited, a burial, and this is diagnostic for humans. Here, the suggestion Homo and lady is burying their dead through these <laughs> items. Looking at the anatomy of the postcranial skeleton and the whole skeleton, you have about the same picture as before, half, half, red, ape-like, blue, homo-like features. Um, especially interesting, oops, is the small brain size of 560 cubic centimeters, so chip like about a little bit more than chip. So what do we have here? A tool making, tiny brained, spiritual climbing biped. So because of the little brain size, the small brain size, Berger, the finder says, well, brain size doesn't seem to matter. But this diagnosis does not follow Wood's definition of homo. And most interesting, so it's just a side remark, the first dating was 2.5 million years because of the anatomy, the very primitive anatomy, the anatomy. Then the second dating was 0.9 million years per anatomy. And then there comes the uranium thorium, <coughs> Dating and it is 230,000. So it's almost a tenfold difference. So this is a real strange 
thing, very young, very primitive, and well, we don't know. So now let's go to easier parts of paleoanthropology. 200,000 years later, and 10,000 miles away in the Far East. The Hobbit, the enigmatic human fossil from the Far East, Isaac uh, Flores in Indonesia. Nice skeleton as well. It was dated when it was published, 2004, was dated to 18,000 years. Of course, sapiens. Tools and behavior, sapiens. Tiny body size, okay, one meter. Mm -hmm. Iron dwarf sapiens. There were also some unusual features. Tiny brain size, chimp sized. And relative to body size, it was also a pinnacle sized brain. Well, doesn't matter. And some other strange features. Here we have the small skull and nice, very nice um, tools. The brain organization from the endocast was looking very human-like, kind of human-like. And the skeleton, this huge feet, well, the problem was that they were diagnosed sapiens because they were found on the other side of the Wallace line, which was said to be the absolutely border for any earlier humans. So this was the paradigm, no crossing of this Wallace line. That's why the tools on the island have been refuted, which were dated to almost a million years. But on time, people got open for new thoughts, and the new dating is now 60,000. There's another um, homo um, hobbit, another hobbit in Far East, just found a couple of months ago, 50,000 years, pretty nice human, but Australopithecus like curved fingers and curved foot bones. So let's look uh, to the skeleton. If you look at the feet, you see huge feet. So huge feet, you wouldn't be able, it's almost two thirds of your shin bone, yeah? Imagine walking, you can't walk. So we have eight and 11 um, features, sapiens and reactors, but there are also many other features belonging to Hobbins and Australopithecus. And because of the old tools which have been found and dated, there was opening, the, um, it was, um, uh, the frame was opening that maybe this one was ancestor. Australopithecus was the ancestor of these, an interesting hobbit. So, now we've got bipedality, bipedality in brain size mixed up all over the place. Are there still valid human features? Let's look to some more <coughs> bipedal forms. A very old one, 4.4 million. The Ardipithecus, it's a tree climber, has four bipedal adaptations and a strange toe. And I call him a climbing bipedal grasping because it's climbing on the tree on arbor, it's the arby pit. Other um, fossils, Aurepithecus, an animate even older, eight million years, precision grip, human-like short jaw, bipedal adaptation, and very um, interesting toe makes up a bipedal Climber, but it's not diagnosed the hominin because it's too old and on the wrong place. It's in Europe. Same with Morotopithecus, even here, some bipedal adaptations, too old to be a hominid. So Bruce Latimer says there are multiple Pleistocene and pli uh, multiple Pleistocene bipedal adaptations. And we already saw also in the Pleistocene and in the Holocene different kinds of bipedality. There are footprints from Greece uh, on Crete to about six million years old. There are said to be 
uh, made from Berkopithecus seven million years ago, and they just start maybe it could be a homonym. So what about brain size? We already heard it doesn't matter. I just skip it because only five more minutes, and we go to another um, Homo um, species, which was found in '91. And it has a small but human-like brain, human-like short arms and legs, and it looked like a perfect bipedal homo, and it is found in the Near East, in the Middle East, and Tuvan Easy. So everything is fine until we saw strangely twisted elbows, ape-like behavior, and nobody really know how to <coughs> label this found in Georgia, in Tuvan Easy, Erectus Augusta Georgius, no idea. But then they found more skulls with an enormous variability. And this Manisi gang, this was kind of like a real bro. This skull looks like Ossilopithecus <coughs> proboscis. That's my long term find of Ossilopithecus. So, what they say, these are all found in the same layer, in the same place, to the same time have a brain size range from 500 to 800. It's a range of Australopithecus, um, maybe Augusta. It has very distant, uh, very distinct facial forms. So now it's very large and not very large. Different teeth use. So the conclusion was the Domenisi sample, including all the skulls, represent normal within deem variation. An evolutionary continuity within one population at the same time and the same place, all in one, same time, same place, <coughs> deem. How are we going to label this one? Um, Perhaps this is kind of like a hybridization program. But I have to skip and I look at the, if it's not, if it's not bipedalism, and if it's not brain size, then it must be technology, as Lee Berger said. But it's just a couple of months ago. Even in this topic with archaeology, <coughs> it's um, said that the African archaeology record demonstrates that demonstrates a polycentric origin. It has been completely different from just a couple of years ago, and it ten, extends into deep time. So there's no gradual and local continuity, as believed before, and there are also tools, stone tools, far spread across the world, more than two million years in China. So this is even older than we know from Africa. So the multi-region origin also for early stone tools. What can we say to this? Here we have art. This is the explosion of uh, Homo sapiens art. And if you look very closely to it, you see the lion man, the mothered, uh, mammoth tooth, made from mammoth tooth 40 years ago. And if you look closely, it's a bipedal lion or a lion-headed man. And it certainly is the earliest piece of art of a chimera, of a mixed creature. We have mixed creatures um, all over the time in every country and cre um, culture. Um, from just, uh, you see that, also from Bavaria. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Van de Pavel, who did the genetic work. He says, well, we are all one. We are very uh, variable. We are all one. John Hawk says, some species of our genus look a lot like Australopithecus. <laughs> so, hybridization, anything goes. It's a non-gradual mixture, egg-like skulls and human-like locomotion. Human-like skull and egg-like locomotion. Apex skull and apex locomotion. Is this all human? 
Nothing, anything goes and nothing matters. Doesn't it sound like an ancient version of postmodern view? So what we had in the 1980s, gradual accumulation of beneficial traits, leading to new species. Now we have free mix of variables, variable trait complexes across assumed genus boundaries, species both chronologically and, lo and locally, ecologically separated, similar looking species widely distributed across space and time, no hybridization between related species versus intensive genetic exchange via free migration and free hybridization sharing ideas. So everybody and everything out of Africa, 1980, and now everybody and everything out of America. <laughs> many almost ancestors, many modes of vitality, many potential trees. We are almost there. Discrete gaps in gradual tree doesn't hold anymore. We have now anything goes and nothing matters. Neither gaps nor tree, but a web. A web instead of a gap or a tree. Kind of disappointing, isn't it? I have no solution for you. For you. So now we have another a different new mantra for paleontology. We need more fossil. No, we need a new paradigm. So the question mark is between both of us here, John John from and Friedemann Schrenk and myself. No gap, no tree. Maybe this makes them stopping for obsessive search for the one ancestor. Many paleontologists now are able to find one. Maybe we should look for at different places elsewhere for the gap. So how to explain this web pattern? Great number of atavisms, extensive parallel evolution, heterochronic processes, deep homology, deep morphology, exchanging ideas via hybridization across genera, and on the very left side, very deeply programmed variability question marks. It's the riddle of human origins. There's another famous riddle, you know, from the Sphinx. Which creature has one voice and yet becomes four-footed in the morning, two-footed at noon, and three-footed in the evening? You know, it's about the number of feet and the humans during our lifespan, of the individual one, individual lifespan. It's quite unstable by the reality. And it gives our view towards the destructive of death. So humanity and creation is in crisis. Actually, we are wonderfully made, we are wonderfully mixed, and we are also pretty much messed up. <laughs> Nature <coughs> shapes God create, God's creation by evolving his ideas in our own ways. And Homo, we are designed to partner with God to mend this divided and messed up world. The Hebrew says, Tikkun Thank you. <laughs>